Thank you so much. So in the next 10 minutes or so, sorry, it will be somewhat of a whirlwind tour of kind of our existing therapies and then a little bit more on uh, what we can be excited about in the future. So these are the approved biologics that we currently have in the three classes that we have available to us now. Uh, the anti-TNFs, the integrin-based therapies, particularly vitalizumab for, for both uh, indications and ustekinumab. So I'm not going to spend too much time on the TNF story because I think what is what is clear about TNF is that we do have an immunogenicity problem and we do have an underdosing problem and we do have a loss of response problem. So what it all comes down to is this lesson that we learned from the TNFs, we need to be able to learn from that and apply it to all biologics. The reason why I say that, and we talked a little bit about exposure response, and those of you who've heard me speak before, I'm really just focused on it's a dosing issue. And we probably aren't even on the right dosing or the maximum dosing for our current biologics that we have approved across all three classes. We know that when you develop dosing and you're looking for population level pharmacokinetics, it doesn't necessarily apply to the patient is sitting in front of you. And the ability to understand how clearance of the drug is individualized. So the story of dosing, I only bring it up to say as I now show you the data on uh, the integrins and the um, P40s, just to remember that exposure response is what's important. Less so what goes in, but more so about what actually stays in. And that's really the story of how we need to start thinking about dosing of drugs. This slide is meant to be overwhelming and exciting at the same time. The idea that we have currently a lot of different classes that we have finally uh, in our arsenal for Crohn's, but also what the future looks like. And I'll show you what the uh, short-term future looks like in, in um, just a moment. In terms of the starting with the integrin base, I like to bring this slide to show you kind of in summary how do we think about the data for both the primary and secondary uh, endpoints from the Gemini 2 trial. And you could see here as the lines cross the dash line, um, you can see that those are insignificant. Those are to the right favoring vitalizumab shows that it reached significance. So these are the outcomes that were significant in the registration trials. Uh, clinical remission uh, at week six, and then there was the um, maintenance uh, secondary endpoints and maintenance primary endpoint of clinical remission. Q8 versus Q4, as a reminder, Q8 was, uh, Q4 was not significantly or sufficiently better than Q8, hence where we have our current dosing of maintenance of Q, uh, of Q8 with some patients needing to be escalated to Q4, but that would again be in a more off-label setting. The reason why I, I put this slide is I think to me when I educate families and patients about expectations, I always frame it in the context of the sequence of therapies they have received. Because to date, outside of JAX, which I'll show you the data in just a minute, the data is clear that when you give anti-TNF to somebody, it either changes the biology or it's a reflection of disease severity that if they are either a primary non-responder or a loss of response, they don't do as well to their next therapy that you introduce. We've seen this particularly with um, vitalizumab, and we see the same with uh, ustekinumab. I'll show you that in just a moment. So I think it's important to remember that we need to start segmenting our patients and saying, is this patient, can we use a non-anti-TNF strategy first rather than using the TNF strategy first and then uh, asking them to be responsive to a second or possibly a third class. I think these are important points where the uh, impact of using TNF prior to your next sequence of therapy will matter. And in the future, when we have two or three more Crohn's targets, it's almost going to be impossible to know which is the right sequence, and that's partly on us to figure out from a personalized medicine perspective what our expectations are in terms of the sequence of therapies. Etrolizumab is no different. That's the other integrin that's being developed for uh, IBD. I'm showing the Crohn's data here. What's important to focus is that you could see that the bulk of what drives the response in this treatment was the TNF-naive patients. This is actually even more dramatic, I find, than what I've shown on the vitalizumab side, the idea that TNF exposure impacts your success on your next target. 
I think one of the big mysteries we have or questions we have is how do we position these as I started to hint if we take uh, ustekinimab out for just a minute and we think about, okay, before uh, ustekinimab came out, I was really debating is this patient adequate for TNF or should I roll out the Integrin strategies? Miguel, I think you introduced that concept in that treatment uh, IV steroid failure, a hospitalized patient, that's like a whole other you know, decision-making process. But what about the outpatient, moderate, steroid-dependent? Are there certain segments or types of phenotypes that I need to be thinking about in terms of deciding what my strategy would be? I kind of listed some just so, um, again, to generate more discussion maybe in the case, but things like perianal disease, would you go with one target over another? Acute severe colitis, you mentioned. Severe extraintestinal manifestations. If a patient is advancing in age, has a history of malignancies, would you go with a more gut-targeted and less of a systemic-based therapy? So these are things that we all need to be thinking about and not just kind of pulling out what we're comfortable with because you need to start thinking about the individual patient sitting in front of you. One of the, probably when you think about the future, one of the things that I think is very interesting is that perianal disease, as we know, complex perianal disease is probably to me one of the most malignant forms of Crohn's disease. It's very difficult to treat, and in patients with anal strictures and severe rectal disease, it's almost an ostomy that you can predict will actually happen for our patients. So one of the things that has been introduced into our space is uh, this idea of using um, mesenchymal stem cells to be used in the fistula tract itself for patients who this was a trial of phase two, we're going to enter into a, a bigger phase three trial, the idea that you can use stem cells into the fistula tract to somewhat heal over and, and um, regranulate over these fistula tracts and close them. You can see that there's about a 20% delta um, between those patients who actually were successful versus those that weren't successful in the control versus the active intervention group. So I think this is TBD in terms of how much more it will actually help on the perianal space, but although it's not a drug target, particularly a cytokine or some kind of target, I did want to not forget to introduce this to you to say that this is another area because perianal Crohn's disease, we tend to do all these post-talk analyses except for infliximab, the Accent 2 trial, where we have actual randomized data, all the other drug targets for Crohn's look back at the registration and say, in the small subgroup of patients that had perianal disease in addition to the luminal disease, this was the effect. So the question is, it would be nice to actually have true control data with all of our targets. When we talk about really probably the target that has really uh, penetrated a lot of our space in the last year in terms of Crohn's disease in particular is obviously ustekinumab. The dosing is outlined here and it's based on your weight group just in case as a reminder. And then the approved maintenance dose is actually every eight weeks. And the first dose also as a reminder is IV. I bring this slide up to remind everybody, just as a refresher, Unity 1 are treatment refractory Crohn's disease patients, and Unity 2 are failing conventional therapy for the purpose of not getting into too much of the details. But what I wanted to show you here is in the patients who are not exposed to TNF as a failure, you could see that the response rates, and I can tell you that the remission rates are double that of a patient who has failed TNF. And in the Unity 1, 90% of patients failed either one or two, and another 10% had failed three TNFs by the time they entered into this trial. So important to think about what is the right patient that I'd be using, which target, and again, a, a reminder that the sequence of therapy matters. And that is kind of like, for me, what I like to think about when I'm approaching a patient. This is just showing you, essentially, you're going from 21% to 40% in terms of remission rates if you look at the approved 6 milligram per kilogram dose as opposed to the fixed 130. Also, as a point of interest, the, the graphs do start to separate around week three. A lot of patients say, how quickly should I start to feel an effect? And it's usually around three to four weeks after um, the therapy has been introduced as IV. This is the main at a year, which is 44 weeks after the eight-week uh, endpoint, so it was a total of a year. You can see across the board uh, versus placebo. As a reminder, when you look at maintenance, placebo doesn't mean placebo from minute one. It means drug 
for induction and then randomized to placebo and maintenance. So it's not a pure placebo, so you don't look at the placebo rate in the same way. What we're looking for is whether or not there is a difference compared to placebo in compared to the drug, active, uh, active drug arms. And this is the overall efficacy um, in this trial. So what does our future look like? I think for me, as that slide was meant to be, as I noted, on overwhelming and exciting, is that we've got multiple targets. This is probably the target that at least you mentioned, Tofa, and you see, Corey, in terms of the CD space, uh, the two that are kind of heading into phase three, some have already started to explore this in phase three, is Rizinkinumab, which is the IL-23 only. So as a reminder, Ustakinumab is IL-12 and 23. What we've done moving forward is we've removed the 12, and then we're just focusing on the IL-23 pathway, and there's a multitude of different uh, pharma um, partners who have introduced this concept into immune space. Janssen has IL-23 approved for psoriasis, gasilcomab. Remember, the dosing for psoriasis is much lower than the IBD dose, so don't think you're going to get away with giving the right dose by treating psoriasis with IL-23 in terms of their IBD. This is exciting. This is the phase two data. Um, this is kind of where we're thinking the future is going to be. The safety profile looks to be quite spectacular. So we're excited about bringing that into the Crohn's space and also uh, into the UC space, by the way. There is um, that as well. And probably uh, the next and uh, follow-up to Corey's tofacitinib discussion is the ABT-494, which is the JAK1 selective. So this is going to be in the Crohn space to start. What's interesting, as you could see, is we have the kind of originator idea of JAK1-3, which is tofacitinib. We're going to be more selective with JAK1, make it safer. In terms of Stellara, we've taken the 12 out, just focused on 23, improving safety. So as you can see, we're moving towards improved safety as well as maintaining efficacy. So it is an exciting time in the Crohn space. The other JAK1 selective inhibitor is filgotinib, which similarly showed efficacy in Crohn's patients. And one thing I do want to preface is I made a big deal about TNF exposure with the ustekinumab and vedolizumab. So far, it appears that the JAK efficacy is agnostic to whether you've seen TNF or not in the induction. That is an important message as well. Not only is the sequence important, but it looks to be that the JAK uh, inhibitors behave the same whether you were refractory or naive to TNF. So what are the unmet needs for IBD management? I think I've, you know, we're throwing out all these new targets and the excitement. A head-to-head -head study is probably how we're going to figure out which one is best for which patient. Biomarkers of response quickly, either mucosal or a serologic. New therapies, obviously, will continue. Treat to target strategies. And, of course, probably most important, as I started the conversation, you need to know your customer, you need to know your patient, and you need to treat them in a personalized manner. Thank you so much.